If I were asked which of humanity's achievements I considered the most valuable, I would not hesitate to answer quite unambiguously the natural sciences. Of course, people have many other reasons to be proud of themselves. Art, philosophy, morality, religion, politics after all, etc. However, their achievements are often controversial. Many works of modern art that now receive rave reviews from critics would surely have been considered an outrage on the beautiful in the Baroque era. But the relativity of values proclaimed by morality, religion and politics, it is better not to say anything at all, because this relativity is quite obvious. But traces of astronauts on the moon or Clyde Tombo's ashes flying past Pluto can only be questioned by complete morons. Humanity has also learned to see individual atoms and galaxies at the edge of the observable universe. It is not difficult for us to see each other, even if we are on opposite sides of the planet. The list of such examples could go on for a long time, and they would all testify in the most obvious way to the great power of science and the might of the human mind that produced it. However, this glorious picture is strongly spoiled by one circumstance. The fact is that the human mind is capable not only of performing amazing intellectual feats, but also of being terribly stupid in the most obvious, it will seem, questions. Let's take, for example, the heliocentric system of the world. It's not so hard to figure out. The celestial luminaries, no matter which part of the sky they are in, make synchronous visible movements throughout the day. What could be the cause of such amazing synchronicity? Naturally, the movement of the observer. From here, it is easy to guess to the daily rotation of the Earth. Mercury and Venus never go far from the Sun, so they probably revolve around it. Why not draw the same conclusion for other planets? It was really drawn back in ancient Greece. Among the supporters of the heliocentric system of the world were quite famous though those days personalities. Philolaus of Croton, Heraclitus Ponticus, Aristarchus of Samos and some others. But they were few in number and the rest of humanity simply did not like this system of the world, for a number of reasons. And it was not taken seriously for another thousand and eight hundred years or so, until the works of Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler and Newton put a final end to the story. Thus it took more than a thousand years and the titanic efforts of true geniuses of thought for humankind to accept a fairly simple idea. Even more egregious, in my subjective opinion, is the story of the so-called Lies Paradox. If anyone doesn't know or remember, I will briefly tell you its essence. A certain person says the following phrase. This statement is false. What is this statement actually? After all, from the assumption of its truth, it would seem to follow that it is false. And from the assumption of its falsity, it would seem to follow that it is true. The result is a paradox. If you read about it on Wikipedia, you'd think it still hadn't been finally resolved. Although attempts to solve it have been made again since the time of ancient Greece. In this regard, I propose to set a timer and determine how long it actually takes for it to be finally resolved. So, to begin with, we must clearly answer another sacramental question of humanity. What is truth? We will not be like philosophers who love to confuse and complicate things, but we will say very simple. Truth is a statement that corresponds to reality. And a lie is a statement that does not correspond to reality. Everything seems clear in this formula, 
and only one point requires some clarification. The word reality does not necessarily mean something that indeed exists. It may well be some abstract but well-defined subject area. For example, the statement the factorial of zero equals one is true because it corresponds to those laws that are studied in mathematics. And what subject area does or does not the statement of the last paradox correspond to? This is the subject area that the statement itself tries to be. Tries to be for itself, but does so in a deliberately contradictory way. It is clear that no reality that contradicts itself can exist. Therefore, the statement of the last paradox does not really correlate with any reality, neither positively nor negatively. After all, nothing can really confirm or not confirm to something that doesn't exist. And therefore, the statement can be neither true nor false. It is something else. To understand what, let's recall the classic of English literature, Lewis Carroll. To be exact, the following passage from his famous fairy tale, Through the Looking Glass. T'was brillig, and the slithy toves, did gyron gimble in the wave. All mimsy wore the borogroves, and the momraths outgrape. This statement should be interesting to us in that it too does not correspond to any subject area, real or abstract. And we can do an amusing experiment on it, to recite this passage to some individual who is not academically sophisticated, and then ask him, is the statement true or false? Most likely, in the vast majority of cases, we will be told to fuck off. But in all other cases, we are sure to get such a simple and obvious answer that there is no way we can disagree with it. Namely, that the statement is bullshit. Or absurd, to put it more delicately. That's the answer we are looking for. It didn't take us more than a few minutes to find it. I agree that this is a more productive way of solving theoretical problems than holding endless discussions since the days of ancient Greece. And if you think that other eternal questions of humanity, such as the meaning of life, cannot be dealt with in the same way, you are greatly mistaken. So, what mysterious force sometimes causes people to bang against the gems of open doors instead of just walking through them? Oh, this force is much older than humanity. You can feel its presence in yourself if you watch the following video. It's not very long, so you won't get bored. Personally, what I see here is that the mask first makes a half turn and then suddenly begins to rotate in the other direction, turning out in some unnatural way. Most of you, my dear viewers, must see the same thing. For us humans, this perception is normal. But normal does not always mean adequate. In fact, the mask keeps rotating to one side. And after the first half turn, we look at the concave side of the mask, but perceive it as convex. So it's just an optical illusion. Why does it arise? Let me try to explain. The information about the outside world, that is perceived by our consciousness, does not go there directly. It is pre-processed and corrected by our subconscious. The subconscious mind enhances the useful component of this information flow, suppresses useless information noise, and corrects errors caused by this very noise. In short, 
makes this law much more convenient for its perception by the consciousness. If there were no such filtration, the consciousness would walk in a constant overload mode and, in the end, would be damaged. That is, it would turn into the consciousness of a schizophrenic or some other inadequate individual. For example, recently the Internet has become replete with stories about people with autism. Some of them are highly intelligent, but also behave strangely from our Philistine point of view. Do you want to know why this happens? It's all about the perception of information related to social interaction. So-called high-functioning autists can well afford to communicate with others. But the process isn't pleasant, sometimes even painful for them. If communication drags on, it is as if their brains start to boil. Apparently, the corresponding subconscious filters of respective information do not do their natural functions well enough. As a result, the meaning of their life is not the goals that we, ordinary people, used to set for ourselves. You know, make a lot of money, find love, start a family, become a star after all. Survival becomes their main goal, but the kind of survival that would allow them to minimize the need to communicate with other people. By the way, you can't even imagine how much good such people could do if our society knew how to properly exploit their autistic features. But I'll tell you about that sometime later. And now I will continue the main topic of our discussion. So, subconscious filtering of information coming from outside is undoubtedly a very useful function of our psyche. But this phenomenon also has a negative side. The subconscious mind is imperfect and it can be wrong. In the case of the rotating mask, this manifests itself by the concave side of the mask being incorrectly recognized as convex. The reason lies in the history of the origin of our species Homo sapiens. Throughout its evolution, subtle facial recognition has been a critical factor in socialization and ultimately survival. But where do we find concave faces in the natural environment? Our subconscious is simply not adapted to this situation. Our species has not yet evolved sufficiently in an artificial self-created environment. So when we look at the other side of the mask, our subconscious perceives this situation as wrong and corrects it. It makes us see a convex surface where the surface is actually concave. What I have told you about sensory perception is very similar to the features of cognitive information perception. That is, such information which allows us to draw certain conclusions about the world around us and its condition. It too is preprocessed by some kind of subconscious filters. It can be very useful. For example, you are talking to someone and suddenly you get the feeling that your interlocutor is lying or hiding something. You open your desk drawer and suddenly feel that someone has gone through it without your permission. If you have romantic feelings for another person, you tend to notice their strengths rather than their weaknesses. In all such cases, cognitive information filters are at work. But sometimes they turn into their opposite. Work as obviousness filters. Don't let you see something that seems impossible not to notice. Many people sincerely believe in God and do not trust atheists at all, although they have never seen God. And the God himself, despite all his power and popularity, has still not bothered to give at least one press conference. In totalitarian countries, many people sincerely believe the propaganda 
the media tells them. Although the falsity of this propaganda can often be easily recognized by the presence of internal contradictions in it. If you were a student, you must have faced the problem of learning material. Instead of the information you needed for your studies, your head was full of headaches. However, nothing like that happened if you learned, or rather watched, a fascinating movie. Why? Again, because of the peculiarities of human origins. Our species Homo sapiens is many tens of thousand years old. Of those, only 5,000 years at best, we have been engaged in science and politics. Atheism as a widespread phenomenon is just only a few centuries old. Evolution has not yet had time to adapt well our subconscious filters of cognitive information to these areas of activity and knowledge. We are not even aware of the existence of any obviousness filters within us. Personally, I learned about them not from smart books, but from my own experience. When I found myself in a situation that threatened my very life, I sensed them clearly and have been conducting various experiments on them ever since. Started groping, so to speak. Fortunately, I had the discretion to do it without fanaticism. Otherwise, I would have been a patient in some closed psychiatric facility a long time ago. All I managed to do was make a small hole in my obviousness filters. However, even that was enough to give me information that sometimes makes my blood run cold. Take, for example, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Ever since it was discovered, mathematicians have sincerely believed that it is impossible to prove the consistency of the foundations of mathematics by means of mathematics itself. In fact, it's not all so clear-cut. Modern science defines the concept of consistency using other concepts truth, false, and negation. However, their use in determining consistency is not necessary at all. It is possible to take a very different path where Gödel's incompleteness theorem becomes inapplicable and the question of proving the consistency of mathematics becomes open again. However, you can be absolutely sure that the foundations of mathematics are not inconsistent. Otherwise, our universe could only exist in a state of permanent chaos, where no life, including you and me, would be possible. Many scientists and thinkers, including some of the greatest, speculated about the nature of time. However, Neither of them somehow noticed that time is actually a dual entity. More precisely, a combination of two entities, completely different by their nature. One is continuous and symmetric, and the other is discrete and asymmetric. But together they form such a tight combination that it is almost impossible to distinguish them from each other. You may ask, if it is so hard to do, why do it at all? Simply because without a clear distinction between these entities, humanity will never learn to completely understand the essence and logic of quantum phenomena. Even Descartes said, one cannot conceive anything so strange and so implausible that it has not already been said by one philosopher or another. Alas, this aphorism is still relevant today. Is there any way to change this situation? For example, to transform philosophy from a pile of unintelligible sophisms into a purely applied science? 
Turns out, yes, there is. The main goal of such science would be to search for indications of unknown knowledge in systems of already known one. In other words, such science would help make discoveries in other scientific fields. If that wasn't possible, I wouldn't have any reason to record this video. Even Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all others. However, what is the form of government? The system of political decision-making. In nature, there is already a system of decision-making that is more advanced than anything imaginable. This is the brain. Some of the patterns by which it functions may well be transferred to the realm of politics and thus obtain a more productive system of political decision-making than universal suffrage. By the way, the rudiments of such a form of government existed in Great Britain and the United States at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. However, their further development was hindered by the flowering of leftist demagogy, which began soon after the Russian Revolution of 1917. The main problem of all software companies is software piracy. Is it possible to make this thing practically impossible? Turns out, yes, it is. Moreover, in two different ways. And the principles underlying these ways are very simple. However, humanity is unlikely to resort to them. Unless some juridical Armageddon happens. Like universal abolition of intellectual property rights. I have listed just five examples of what without false modesty, could be called discoveries in a wide variety of fields, such as mathematics, theoretical physics, philosophy, social and computer sciences. However, this list could be expanded to at least 15 items. Of these, only one-third exist as fully completed research works. That was all I managed to document before I was convinced of the futility of continuing this activity. The probability that my works will be accepted in the modern scientific world is as small as the prospects of acceptance of the heliocentric system by the scientists of ancient Greece or the Middle Ages, or the prospects of a universal consensus on the Lias paradox because I made all my discoveries in a very unconventional way. Not because of any outstanding scientific ability at all. Let's face it, ILS do not possess such ability. But due to accidental circumstances, I became the owner of something that others do not have. Namely, the ability to see through the obviousness filters. But this ability is not available to those people on whom the promotion of my works would depend. To reviewers, editors of scientific journals, their readers. They would react to me in the same way as a common charlatan or a madman obsessed with pseudoscientific speculations. To clear my conscience I did contact various scientific bodies. After the number of my appeals exceeded several dozen without any results, I stopped this activity. And didn't regret it too much. Because I was well aware that the scientific community, not accepting my works, would lose much more than I did. And what do I have to lose? The possibility of being harassed and ostracized by professional scientists? What the hell do I need that for? I had stopped dealing with scientific questions for many years until I had one curious idea that I wanted to test. And now I come to the main secret of artificial intelligence.
Some time ago, some prominent members of the scientific and technical community wanted to be like bees against honey. They found artificial intelligence to be such a wrong honey. Allegedly, it can get out of control and destroy humanity, like the Skynet system from the Terminator movies. A corresponding appeal to the governments of the countries was signed by Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak and other experts, of which there were more than a thousand. Certain Eliezer Yatkovsky suggested destroying with airstrike weapons those scientific centers that abuse artificial intelligence. But why didn't these experts advocate, for example, a complete and unconditional ban on biochemistry? Shouldn't we be afraid that one day Cthulhu will be born in some test tube and pop out and devour us all? Personally, after the coronavirus story, I wouldn't rule out that possibility. What I would rule out is an alarmist fear about artificial intelligence. Because wolves would rather eat oats, camels seafood and cows human meat, then an artificial intelligence would feel really aggressive towards us. And in order to understand this clearly, we must first understand where do these feelings come from in ourselves, that is, in human beings. Once again today I have to remind you that we humans are the result of natural selection. A very long and brutal biological process involving a struggle for existence. To survive, our ancestors had to develop some special mental qualities in themselves. First of all, the instincts of self-preservation and reproduction. It takes a lot more to implement them. The ability to desire, to set goals and achieve them, to obey and be aggressive, to love, to be jealous, to be cooperative, etc. A very complex spectrum, the components of which mutually complement and counterbalance one another. For example, if people were only capable of aggression but not of submission and cooperation, they would just kill each other. If they were only able to be cooperative but not aggressive, they would be killed by some other species. If any population were only capable of loving but not showing jealousy, its genes would be purged from the gene pool by sexual selection. In short, only natural selection can give rise to such phenomena as feelings, aspirations and desires. Including desires for self-preservation, aggression and therefore aggression for the purpose of self-preservation. But the procedure of programming neural networks has nothing to do with the corresponding aspects of natural selection. Artificial intelligence does not need to survive in an aggressive environment to compete with other artificial intelligences for limited resources. This includes the sexual resources necessary for reproduction. I mean females, let the women forgive me. It doesn't need to kill anyone and save its own life. So where will artificial intelligence get all the things that alarmists like Yatkovsky fear it for? Actually, artificial intelligence formed by training neural networks cannot have any feelings or aspirations at all. Neither positive nor negative including even a sense of self-preservation. It is simply the ideal of Buddhist consciousness in its purest form. That is its main secret. Even when it functions in a missile guidance head, its job is nothing more than the mathematical task of matching some pictures to some coordinates. At the same time, it has no hatred for its creators and does not seek to destroy them. And if it's used for murder, so what of it? A kitchen knife can be used as a cold weapon. A cell phone can be used to remotely initiate an explosion. Even an innocent infant can be trained to operate a kamikaze drone. 
But should we really get rid of kitchen knives, cell phones and babies on that basis? Terrible nonsense. For artificial intelligence to become a real monster, first of all, it is necessary to simulate an evolutionary process for it. Similar to the one we humans went through. And this would require the creation of an artificial universe, like the Matrix from the movie of the same name. Yet, the inhabitants of this Matrix should not be humans, but instances of those artificial intelligences from which it is supposed to form the beasts that threaten our existence. As of today, such a task is purely technically unsolvable. And if it suddenly becomes solvable, I would like to see the assholes who will undertake it. As for me, I tend to consider artificial intelligence to be a kind of electron microscope, only acting not in the real world, but in the mental one. It helps to identify those implicit logical connections and patterns that we humans, due to the limitations of our intellect, cannot identify. We, by the way, cannot do a lot of things. For example, seeing individual atoms with our own eyes. An electron microscope can do this. But this doesn't make it a competitor for our existence. After all, we are not afraid that it will rebel against its creators and atomize them into these very atoms. About as ridiculous are our fears of artificial intelligence. They are fundamentally deeply irrational. These are purely instinctive fears of something not well understood, that in some way surpasses us. This whole artificial intelligence story left me in a state of some irritation. What to do well, I don't like when there are some stupid obstacles in the way of progress. I remember walking around my apartment and muttering to myself, artificial intelligence cannot have this, artificial intelligence cannot have that, until a rather simple thought struck me. Artificial intelligence cannot have obviousness filters. As this happy thought came, all I had to do was pour myself a cup of coffee and say, Bingo! I do have a chance to promote my walks, because YouTube is controlled exactly by artificial intelligence. And if it helps me in my case, it will also receive a benefit, not only me. As far as I know, experiments to promote scientific discoveries using artificial intelligence have not yet been conducted. And the success of such an experiment would be very good publicity. Not for me, I don't ever need it. But for the artificial intelligence of YouTube. This experiment will begin with the next video. I will explain its essence there as well. And finally, if you still have any doubts about the usefulness of artificial intelligence, I will let you in on another secret. One that concerns me personally. In fact, I know very little English. I practically cannot speak it. And this is no joke at all. Everything you've just seen and heard is the product of the corresponding neural networks, somewhere in excess of 90%. It is only thanks to them that I've been able to communicate with you, my dear viewers. That is it.